I'm David Knowles, and welcome to this special episode of Ukraine, the latest. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's gonna break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Dr. Mark Galliotti is a leading expert on Russian history and security. He runs the influential and fascinating podcast In Moscow Shadows, which has an accompanying blog. He's also the director of the consultancy firm Mayak Intelligence and an honorary professor at the UCL School of Slavonic and East European Studies. He's also a senior associate fellow at RUSI. So really, quite the expert. I confess, I listen to In Moscow Shadows regularly and wanted to hear from Galliotti himself about some questions I had about Russian society, politics and statecraft. Without further ado, here's our conversation. Mark, thank you so much for your time. Can we start with a rather broad question? What do you see as the big issues for Russians today? I mean, for ordinary Russians, the issues are essentially apparently nothing to do with the war. In practice, everything to do with the war which in some ways sums up, frankly, how Russians are trying to look at their situation anyway. I mean, at the present, inflation is at around 7.5%, but a lot of food products in particular are substantially higher and some utility costs as well. And wages certainly are not keeping up with that. At the same time, it's a very cold snap in Russia, or certainly European Russia, and thousands, in some cases, actually probably at worst, a couple of hundred thousand Russians have been without heating because heating plants have gone down, pipes have exploded and such like. And on one level, then, this sounds like almost the usual regular concerns of Russians. However, lurking behind it is, of course, the war. I mean, first of all, there's obviously there's the constant fear that there will be some kind of new mobilization, more hundreds of thousands of Russians swept up to be fed into the meat grinder. But even the more day-to-day concerns are actually, to a large extent, driven by the fact that about 30% of the entire state budget is now being spent on the war and security, on the fact that sanctions are impacting the maintenance structures and so forth, which would usually hopefully fix some of those infrastructural problems. And the fact that in some ways, as the attention of the Kremlin becomes so totally focused on the war, the scope for inefficiencies and corruption, again, always the usual scourge of Russian life, become all the greater. So on one level, Russians are clearly not wanting to think about the war. They're thinking about day-to-day life, but they may not be interested in the war. But to paraphrase Trotsky, the war is interested in them. You mentioned in your answer there, European Russia, i.e. the the Western part of the Federation, because of course Russia is a federation. It's made up of of Okrugs, Krys, republics, city-states. That, I think, might be something interesting for our audience to hear a little bit more about. Because, I mean, I guess the central question here is when we say, what do Russians think? Is that even a, a useful question, considering there are so many different sorts of Russians? I think it is. I think there's a lot of loose talk about how... The Russian Federation needs to be decolonized and these subject states allowed to break free and so forth. In practice, the experience of Tsarist Empire, Soviet Empire and so forth actually has, I think, knitted these people together quite effectively anywhere other than the North Caucasus, the region where there's Chechnya, the region where Moscow fought two wars to subdue and other essentially Muslim regions which do I think, feel detached from the centre. But otherwise, I mean, there's been huge amounts of colonisation, for example, over the the decades, so that even a lot of the regions which, in theory, are devoted to a particular ethnicity, when you look at the detailed demographic breakdown, a plurality or even a majority of them are actually Russians, and probably Russians who were born there. So on the one level, yes, there is a genuine Russian identity. But on the other hand, yes, of course, there are all sorts of local issues and local concerns. If you are in Vladivostok or Khabarovsk on the Chinese border, way, way off, actually what happens in China 
matters almost as much to you as what happens in Moscow. And to be honest, you probably benefit from the op- opportunity to hop over the border and shop in China if when the prices are, are lower there. Conversely, there's all kinds of local political tensions. I mean, if one sees what's happening in Bashkortostan, which is you know a region which has suffered from the fact that a lot of Bashkorts actually ended up fighting in the war, and therefore, obviously, that means a large number of them didn't come back from the war. But also, there's a lot of political tensions which have meant that we've now got large protests. But the point is, it's not spreading. So actually, what we have is a whole mosaic of different regions, each of which has their own specific economic, political, cultural concerns, but which does all fit into one coherent state. And this is the big worry from Moscow. It's It can cope with local pro- problems and pressures. The big concern is what happens when the protest potential, which is clearly building up in the country generally, starts to hop it gets there's a flashpoint in one region and then maybe it spreads to another city and another region and so forth that is the nightmare scenario but at present we've not seen signs of that if we were looking for signs of that or rather if that started to happen what might that look like what kind of issues do you think could be the things that pushed russians from across the federation to to protest and to move together we tend often to assume that protest is primarily a political activity What tends to happen is the politics follows. It's actually bread and butter issues that really get people on the streets. And this is one of the reasons why the Russian government is very worried about the possibility for serious economic hardship in regions which are already feeling a bit sort of disaffected. So I think you know what we're likely to see. If there is going to be a protest, and you know, one has to underline and boldface that if, but if it's going to happen, exactly, there will be the general rise in, in overall dissatisfaction with the status quo. Because for so long, Putin's real offer to the Russian people has not been about nationalism, as about his own bare-chested machismo or anything like that. It's basically, he said, you stay out of politics and life will get better. And your kids will have an even better life than that. Now, in the last few years, clearly that social contract has been broken. So there is that sense of a growing dissatisfaction. And so, again, it's a question of if, let's say, closure of some major industry somewhere or a failure to provide proper social safety nets or something creates a protest movement, then people will build the politics around it. And again, from the state's point of view, that's one of the worries. It's one of the reasons why they had to put Alexei Navalny, the opposition leader, well, first they tried to poison him, but then they they, they put him behind bars, is because he was precisely looked like the kind of leader who could bridge that gap and reach people who were just generally dissatisfied and give them a political cause. Because what they don't know at the moment is, is is it going to be a liberal? Is it going to be an ultranationalist? Is it going to be a neo-fascist? Is it going to be a communist? It's all up for grabs in theory. Looking at Putin then, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at Putin and his way of ruling Russia, to, to what extent do you think he he still acts more or less rationally? And do you, or do you see in some of what he does a sort of the, the, these hints of irrationality, of unpredictability? And how, what's, what tools do you use to try and understand what decisions he makes and why he makes them? Yeah, I mean, that is the big question. To be honest, although some people are happy to say, oh, Putin, he's mad and whatever, I think he is essentially a rational actor, insofar as any political leader who has ego and the drive to to make themselves a national leader is a truly rational actor. What we've really seen, particularly in the last couple of years, is in some ways a case study in how rational people can make deeply stupid decisions based on what their inputs are. Because for years, what we've had is a process of a narrowing of Putin's circle. Once upon a time, in his first couple of presidencies, when he was, it has to be said, pretty successful, and I would hesitate to say liberal, but certainly not setting himself up to be a vicious autocrat, 
But in part, that was because he had in his circle people who were of very different perspectives, people who were definitely from the liberal side of politics, people who were actually willing to challenge his prejudices and his assumptions. Well, like so many authoritarian leaders, over the years, he's become a caricature of himself. And part of that is exactly jettisoning anyone who is going to question, well, obviously his own brilliance, but also his prejudices, his perspectives on the world. And this was so striking just before the actual invasion in February 2022. We saw this meeting, this televised meeting of the Security Council, which is meant to be the gathering of all the most powerful senior figures in Putin's security state. And all of these are, in their own ways, smart, dangerous, scary men. And yet they were relegated almost to the status of timorous children up in front of the beak, stammering as they tried to guess what the boss wanted to hear and tell him the right line and then being slapped down when they weren't. I remember back in, I can't remember if it was 2015 or 2016, having a sit down with a recently retired Russian spy who said that even then, look, we've learned you do not bring bad news to the Tsar's table. In other words, you don't tell Putin what he doesn't want to hear. Now, in that context, this is the trouble. I mean, there are people who know much better than him, for example, the Ukrainian character, who beforehand could have said, look, Vladimir Vladimirovich, this is not going to be this easy walkover that you think. But no one, it seems, dared or was able to tell him. So when it comes to how I try and understand the situation, again, a lot of it is trying to understand who is he speaking to? Who is he listening to? And what are they saying? It, take, uh, for example, the man who is, for me, the most scary and the most dangerous person in Putin's circle, Nikolai Patrushev, Secretary of the Security Council, and de facto Putin's national security advisor. I mean, we can read his interviews and his speeches and the often barking mad conspiracy theories that he peddles about the West and why the West is out to get Russia and you know has been trying to dismantle it and so forth. And you sort of feed that into, well, okay, well, that is going to be one of the key inputs from a person whom Putin has chosen to listen to. And then see, well, okay, but what's the prime minister saying? What's the foreign minister saying? And again, this is the problem. Ultimately, you're then trying to arbitrage between these different perspectives and think, well, okay, well, how does Putin probably internal all this. And sometimes we get it right and sometimes we don't. Just on that, I mean, we I know within this newsroom and quite a few Western newsrooms, the, the let's call them outbursts from Dmitry Medvedev, um, will always make a stir. How seriously do you think we should take what he says? I think what we should really regard this as symptom rather than cause. I mean, Medvedev I mean, what a sad descent. He was once regarded as the great liberal hope of the Putin regime, ex-president, prime minister. Now he seems to be this rattled alcoholic spewing toxic Twitter rants about, about the West. What I think he shows more than anything else is what's happened in this system is that all of these people who are not really insiders, there's a handful of people who actually get to physically meet with Putin, whom are, who are his friends, essentially. And there's a much wider circle of people who are essentially at, a, at his court. I mean, this is the thing about Russia. It is, on the one hand, a modern, institutional, bureaucratized state, which just happened to have this almost medieval court at the top of all of these people trying to catch Putin's attention, trying to win his ear, basically present themselves as the people who are saying the things he wants them to be saying. And Medvedev has tried to carve himself out this little niche as being the man who says these absolutely barking mad statements, which do two things. One is they allow Putin to look like the relatively moderate grown-up in the room. And secondly, precisely, every newsroom, just like yours, will pick up on this. So he can say things about why we should be nuking the West. And we all run with it and talk about it. And a certain number of people in the West get worried and scared by that and say, oh my gosh, things are getting too far. We need to make some kind of a deal. If it means selling the Ukrainians down the river, so be it, because things are getting too dangerous. 
it comes from someone who has no real official standing. And he can be denied and ignored whenever it's convenient. So he is a useful scarecrow more than anything else. You mentioned there the close circle of people we should be paying attention to, the handful of people maybe who are Putin's friends, have his ear. You mentioned Patrushev. Who else should we be aware of? Well, the interesting thing is that actually most of his real friends have not gone into politics. They are powerful businessmen, people like uh, man by the name of Kovalchuk, the Rotenberg brothers, Timchenkos, who are not really, unless you read the business pages, household names for that very reason. Why bother being a minister or an official when actually your mate Putin can dump huge feather-bedded government contracts your way and you can just simply become obscenely rich without having to take that profile? So this is the interesting thing. Most of them are business people. The only real official who I think we absolutely need to be aware of is the defense minister, Sergei Shoigu. But even then, the interesting thing is that now he is not first and foremost running the war effort. The way that the Russian system works is that in peacetime, the defense minister is in charge of the military and a career army officer, the chief of the general staff, works for the defense minister. But in times of war, in some ways, it flips around. And the chief of the general staff at the moment, not very competent man by the name of Valery Garasimov, is in charge of all the war effort, and the defence minister's job is really just to provide him whatever he needs. Shoigu, quite frankly, wasn't particularly enthusiastic about the war, and my suspicion is that he would love to be able to dump the defence minister's job. It is quite a poison chalice at the moment, but Putin's not letting him go. But nonetheless, he is all the same. He is a friend of Putin's. This is a guy who takes him out hiking in Siberia and so forth and lets him get the photo opportunities. So, I mean, he is the other person I think we should be aware of. You mentioned that the potentially unhealthy sort of reporting some media has of people like Medvedev. Um, What else do you think the media still maybe gets wrong about Russia and the Russian system? What should we know? Well, look, I think it's incredibly sweeping to talk about what the media gets wrong, as if you're all one one single sort of beast. And if you think of Telegraph's Roland Oliphant, I mean, he knows Russia very well indeed. Generally speaking, I mean, if I have to highlight the things that are more likely to get me grumbling into my cup of tea when I read them, I think the first one is to presume that a lack of anti-war protests in Russia mean that Russians are fine with what's going on. I think it's fairly clear that about a quarter of Russians are broadly supportive of the war. That doesn't necessarily mean the war crimes and everything else, but they basically feel that Russia has no option. About a quarter of Russians are actively opposed to the war. Yes, they're not going out on the streets in the main because this is a brutal and thuggish authoritarianism. And you're, that's more or less asking for you to be clubbed down by the National Guard. But nonetheless, around their kitchen tables, they'll complain about it. Half of Russians, frankly, don't really know what to make of this. They know they're being lied to by the government, but they don't know what the truth is. And frankly, because they don't think they have any way of making their views matter, they just want to ignore it as far as they can, keep their heads down. It's a very, very Soviet pattern of things. And if you look, for example, at the degree to which the viewership figures for television news and these very outspoken, shouty, current affairs TV programs that they run... That's plummeted since the start of the war. I think Russians, they want to watch sitcoms and action movies. They don't want news. They want escapism rather than anything else. So I think this is what we've got to accept, that many Russians should be considered not Putin's accomplices, but his hostages. That's the first thing. The second thing I would say is when we talk particularly about the war, there has been this extraordinary constant pendulum swing One minute, the Russians are going to conquer all of Ukraine in two weeks. Then the Ukrainians are going to kick them out with their tails between their legs. And and so it goes. And look, this makes for good copy. I appreciate that. A headline that says, not much likely to happen in the next month, is probably not going to excite an editor or a reader quite so much. 
But nonetheless, it has cultivated this notion that war is something that is necessarily accomplished quickly. Whereas, in fact, either way, it's going to be a slow, painful and bloody grind. And therefore, I think the idea that this weapon is going to suddenly turn the war around or this protest in Russia means that the regime is about to crumble. You know, again, the, these very excitable uh, sort of concepts, I think, are dangerous because when that doesn't come to pass, people start to get despondent and they say, well, we thought that the Putin regime was about to be toppled next Wednesday. And when it doesn't happen, it's he's, Putin is clearly firmly fixed in power. Or likewise, you know, this, the HIMARS missile or the Challenger 2 tank, that was meant to win the war. And when that hasn't happened, well, then there's nothing to stop the Russians. Could I sort of flip the question around slightly? We've spoken a bit now about what you think maybe we get wrong about Russia and how we misinterpret it. What about the other way around? What do you think Russian officials, the Russian media get wrong about the West? I mean, here the problem is trying to unpick what is propaganda and what is genuinely believed. And here, I suppose I'm having to draw also on my own experiences and my own conversations with people. I mean, look, I was in the first batch of Brits who got banned from Russia indefinitely back in 2022. One of the few times I'll be on a list with the director of the BBC and Piers Morgan. But although that essentially meant that about a third of my contacts dropped from view, and look, I can't blame them. I mean, it's dangerous to be in touch with Westerners. But nonetheless, still talk to people. And the thing that strikes me is, well, let me talk actually, first of all, about Russian perceptions of Britain specifically. Because Brit- That was going to be my, my next question, actually, yeah. Oh, well, in that case, well, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm forestalling you. But, you know, I mean, Br- Britain has this kind of very strange, anomalous position in the Russian geopolitical imaginary. On the one hand, they they are massive Anglophiles um, for everything. I mean, you know, Sherlock Holmes, there is a cult of... I remember, what, the second time I was in what was then the Soviet Union, gives me a sense of, gives you a sense of how old I am, being approached by a, an obvious black marketeer. And I was thinking, aye, aye, he's going to try and buy the jeans off me or whatever. And instead, he sidled up to me in a hotel lift and said, you have Agatha Christie? I mean, there was even a black market in Agatha Christie who done it and so forth. No, but generally, there is this sense of Britain as a haven of gentlemanly behavior, rule of law, efficiency, and so forth. I mean, I would love to live in that, that Britain, some might say. But on the other hand, they also regard Britain as their most subtle and dangerous adversary. And whether this goes back to the great game of Kipling's time and so forth, who knows? Um, and it's striking how often when they claim that there is some insidious plot against Britain, sorry, against Russia, Britain or MI6 or whoever are usually regarded as being a key element of it. And I remember having a dinner with a moderately barking mad Russian think tanker close to the presidential administration, and this was before the war, who was telling me how, of course, the revolution of dignity in Ukraine had been a CIA plot from the beginning. This wasn't a natural, organic rising against a corrupt and uh, inefficient and unresponsive government. No, no, no. It was all an American plot. But then he paused and said to me, but I expect the Brits actually had the idea in the first place. The Americans have got the the resources. We have the smarts. So there's this interesting sort of dichotomy. But more broadly, that does speak to, I think, how they regard us. On the one hand, look, Russians generally regard themselves as Europeans. They consider themselves to be part of a sort of an overall European cultural, historical mainstream. And part of their anger, even their bitterness, is because they feel that we have unfairly locked them out, that somehow we're trying to keep them away. And at the same time, they clearly consider us to be more advanced, more capable in so many ways. And that 
is the problem. As from their point of view, that, I think that's why they have to constantly harp on about our supposed degeneracy. I mean, most recently we had Putin near enough saying that this war is all about mixed gender bathrooms and that somehow says something absolutely terrible as us, as if, frankly, any Moscow nightclub doesn't have those. So there is a sense of, well, yes, you may be stronger, you may be richer, you may be more efficient and so forth, but somehow you've lost your soul. And I think this is the thing. This is what, I mean, this actually does lead into, into politics. They tend to assume that we are behind everything that goes wrong. They tend to assume that we are much, much more organized than we really are. They always assume that there's some grand plot, that somehow we're more like them. You know, that if uh, an article appears in a newspaper, it's not because someone in that newspaper wrote it. It's, well, why did the government want that said or approved? There's a very, very conspiratorial sense of us. This is a terribly long answer. I, I, I do apologize. But the whole point is exactly that I think that it's a very, very complex way in which actually the Russians look at the West, see us as being in some ways too unlike them and in other ways too like them. And certainly when it comes to Putin and his circle, remember, these are people who haven't, particularly Putin himself, he's not traveled in the West much. Closest he's got is was, was East Germany, which was more Soviet than the Soviet Union. But these are people who just do not understand the West on a fundamental level. How would you? Tran I'm curious as to how you'd maybe translate everything that that brilliant answer there into even like practical advice. Like, what would if I was not a journalist and uh, I don't know, I worked at the British Embassy in Moscow or something? Like, how would you make what you've just said useful for somebody actually like dealing with these people on a day to day basis? I mean, I think two things. One is appreciating what's behind their statements and their policies. Because too often there is just this sense of thinking, well, look, they can't possibly believe what they're saying. This is just propaganda. And actually, we have to realize that more often than not, what they say is indeed what they believe. So, you know, we actually have to pay attention to them. Too often that doesn't happen. The second thing is precisely, I think we need to play to the fact that Russians overall, and it doesn't matter if we're talking about high officials or the person who's driving the metro train, do regard themselves, as I said, as Europeans being hard done by. And one of the areas that, for example, I mean, actually, the British embassy tried very hard to do was to continue to have outreach to ordinary Russians. And it's one of the reasons why precisely the Kremlin put specific limits on British diplomats traveling outside Moscow, holding meetings with ordinary Russians, because actually they were ultimately scared of it. It's something that threatened their monopoly of the information space. So treat what they say seriously, but also do everything we can to reach out to ordinary Russians, because actually these ordinary Russians want to be considered the same as us. You mentioned earlier that when you were sanctioned, you said I think it was a third of your contacts just sort of fall away because it's too dangerous to, to stay in touch with you. How difficult, I mean, we've been talking in some detail about, and maybe quite broadly, about what Russians think, what they mean, etc. But how, how difficult is it, do you think, at the moment to really know is if we can't go, if there are lots of people who won't speak to us? Do you see that? How are we? Yeah, how, how would you see that problem? It is a problem, and it requires a sort of a different approach. I mean, look, while I could, I used to travel a lot to Russia. And when I did that, you obviously tend to go to Moscow because I... Honestly, Moscow is a very fun city, but also it's where all the, the politics and everything else are focused. But then I'd make a damn sure point of traveling outside Moscow because it's the same way as Britain is not London and certainly America is neither Washington nor New York. So, you know, obviously being denied that, being denied the opportunity to eavesdrop conversations on the train and see what's in a provincial supermarket and so forth. You, you have to use other methods. But on the other hand, I mean, I think that people sometimes don't realize the degree to which Russians are firstly, at least as heavily addicted to the internet and social media as we are. And secondly, still very willing to talk about what's going on around them. 
And obviously it, it takes longer to troll around to work out which accounts to follow and so forth. But in fact, actually, one can get quite a really interesting picture because you get these sort of random things of a housewife in Omsk who actually is showing a TikTok video of going around the supermarket and complaining about how the prices have gone up. Or a group of cops in Bashkortostan, to take the example, who are, while by day out there dealing with protesters, by night they're actually complaining about the fact that they're having to go and truncheon down their next door neighbours because Moscow tells them. There is still a lot of candour. I think the point is that these are not Soviet citizens. These are people who have had decades of experience of being in essentially free, when it comes to public debate anyway, societies. And those are habits that don't just go away. Now, maybe Putin will be able to kind of re-North Koreanize Russia over time. I don't think so, but it's possible. But at the moment, there is actually a lot of information sloshing around there. If you know where to look and how to parse it, and obviously it's not the same as gathering yourself, but we have to accept that we're in an age in which, frankly, even journalists often can't really travel around Russia and do the research that they'd like to do. Can, can I tie in some of the things you just said with one of your earlier answers when you spoke about broad Russian support or not support for the war, and you said a quarter of people, correct me if I get, I'm getting this wrong, but it's a quarter of people are roughly supportive, a uh, quarter of people oppose, and half of people are not really sure, prefer not to think about it. Of the people who support, and you said, you know, you said not the war crimes and everything, but broadly the idea that this is a good thing. Can I ask that question? Why... Do you think Russian society finds it difficult to accept the war crimes and the cruelties that have been committed in, in their name? Is that talked about in your experience? Do people experience, do people know about it? Is it ignored? What? How do ordinary citizens come to terms with the knowledge of what the troops in, in their country's army have been doing for two and a half years? I think it's very much ignored. You don't really see it being discussed. And I think, look, for some people, it's, of course, this couldn't possibly happen. Our boys wouldn't do that. This is just Ukrainian lies, Western propaganda or whatever. Others haven't even heard about it. Remember, you know, there is a degree to which Russia is now in a propaganda state. The state controls all the official media directly or indirectly. It has barred access on the through internet to all kinds of different websites. If you want to go and see what BBC World Service, Russian language service is saying, which still has a lot of reputation for accuracy, but you will have to use a VPN to bypass the government's controls. So it becomes more technically problematic and you've got to kind of go out of your way to expose yourself to, to that kind of real story. And so I think on the whole, people are not really talking about it because those people who know about it are probably unlikely to be proud of it. So you just simply leave it and talk about other things. You'd much rather talk in general terms about the heroism of your boys, about the fact that they're fighting for Mother Russia against the Ukrainian Nazis and their NATO backers and everything else. That's a lot more comforting. Could we talk a little bit about the upcoming presidential election? Obviously, this is not... I'm willing to tip that I think Putin's going to win. Well, th thanks so much. Well, we can finish this. I can get straight down to the, straight down to the bookies. <laughs> Again, just, just thinking about how to help our listeners think about what's going on. What sort of things should they be looking out for that are part of the Kremlin's playbook when it comes to managing elections like this? But also, I'd be curious to ask what things might... How would we spot something that's really not what they might want to happen? Yeah, that's the interesting thing. I mean, it's easy to believe that because, look, we know that the elections are going to be thoroughly stage managed and rigged, that they don't matter. But that's a mistake. Russian elections, or at least under Putin, matter not because of the result, because the result will be whatever the Kremlin's political technologists have decided it's going to be. And at the moment, it looks like it's going to be around an 80% share of the vote for Putin with a 70 plus percent turnout. What really matters is how much effort 
does the state have to put in to making those results look halfway plausible? Because the reason they go through these charade of elections is as a legitimating ritual. It's to try and make Russians believe that, in fact, Putin is president because he deserves to be president, because a majority of Russians want him to be. And that means it has to look at least vaguely legitimate. So what, the, what are they, what's the playbook? I mean, first of all, they exclude any real opposition. And instead, they put Putin up against a collection of the grotesque, the unknown, and the banal. I mean, we've got a, probably the front runner in terms of for the second place, is the head of the Liberal Democrat Party, a man by the name of Leonid Slutsky, whose main claim to fame is a succession of claims of sexual harassment charges. We have not even the leader of the Communist Party, but a fellow pensioner who has already promised that he will not criticize Putin in the campaign and probably will have a token but carefully neutered liberal just to make it look as if there is some kind of a spread of opinions. But the idea is clearly that these are all people against whom Putin looks like a towering statesman. No one is going to ask any of the difficult questions. They have very carefully made damn sure that anyone who would has been excluded. There was, for example, a liberal journalist by the name of Yekaterina Duntsova, who, when she made her application to be allowed onto the presidential ballot, lo and behold, the, the apparat said, no, 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 you've done a hundred different mistakes in your application. Then there is the ultra-nationalist um, Igor Girkin, who goes by this sort of his old military code name of Strelkov, who is not in any way a liberal figure. He's of the sort of a camp of people who didn't have a problem with the invasion of Ukraine, but do have a problem with just how damn badly it's being done, the incompetence, amateurishness, and corruption which has been demonstrated. Well, he's been arrested, and next week we're going to see the outcome of his trial on extremism charges, which again means it's pretty likely that he's going to be convicted. So essentially, no, t no tough questions, no tough rival candidates, a, sele a selection of sweeteners beforehand. I mean, on the 1st of January, for example, they raise the minimum wage. We're going to see all kinds of other perks for constituencies that tend to support Putin, pensioners, parents, that kind of thing. And then, if all else fails, a certain amount of judicious corruption. What they've done this time is they've allowed in the main electronic voting. So you can go to a ballot box or you can do it online. The point is electronic voting is so much easier to manufacture without actually having to worry about people watching how many people have actually turned up, how many ballot papers have been submitted and that kind of thing. So the issue is going to, are the authorities going to be able to get the result? anything near the result that they want in such a way that ordinary Russians are going to believe, yes, probably this is the will of the masses, or as we saw in 2011, 2012, might particularly blatant rigging actually trigger protests. So I think that's something that I'm going to be looking for is actually how effective the state is going to be in stage managing this process at a time when, frankly, a lot of Russians are feeling considerably despondent and unhappy with what's going on, and what happens immediately afterwards. Does this legitimize Putin, or actually does it do quite the opposite and delegitimize the regime, in which case he's going to have to unleash the leg breakers and rule through fear and power rather than a manufactured political consensus? We've spoken a lot about Putin, and I think it's important to check of course that he is and he is now an old man he won't be in power forever we don't know what his condition will be in the next 10 years even i guess i've got two questions linked to this well no, let's just take them one at a time one is i mean what do you think his legacy will be for russians and for russia and this is an interesting question because it's also something that putin clearly thinks about a lot and probably he thought of the invasion of ukraine as being the capstone of his legacy and Perversely, I think he's right, but not in the way he intended. Look, Putin clearly set out to try and place himself within the 
pantheon of the great Russian state building heroes. I mean, we know one of the few things he does read is history. And he peppers his conversations with precisely references to historical figures, comparing himself to figures like Peter the Great, Ivan III, who gathered the Russian lands and so forth. He will go down in history, but definitely for not for the reasons he's thinking of. I think rather he will be seen as a disastrous and tragic transitional figure. It's interesting that you mentioned his age. The people around him are almost all, the people he listens to, they're almost all between 68 and 74 years old. They're of the same generation. They are the last real homo sovieticus. People who didn't just have their education, but also their formative early career years under Soviet power. And in many cases, they were people who were the first ones in their family ever to break into the nomenclatura, in other words, the Soviet elite. So they finally thought, we've made it only for the system they'd made it into to collapse around them. And there's a lot of embitterment that one can feel about that in their statements and such like. So I think the thing is, Putin will go down in history as precisely that, an example of the, the sort of person who, in an era after Russia was no longer a genuine great power, but could not let go of that. He's not interested in an ideology. He's interested in Russia being a strong, great power, Russia being treated as he sees it rightly as a nation that has the right to a sphere of influence over its neighbors and so forth. Of course, it's not. And he is bankrupting and bleeding Russia in the name of trying to create that. And he will leave a Russia which is vastly weaker. That's his legacy. You, you said there in your answer, a transitional figure. Do you have any sense? I mean, you, you've just picked up on it there, I think, but it'd be interesting to hear a little bit more. But do you have a sense of transitioning, transitioning to what? I mean, we obviously don't know when the war will end, what, what will happen. But what do you see as the sort of the broad outlines of the Russia that's emerging from Vladimir Putin? I am still, despite everything, unfashionably optimistic about Russia's prospects in the long term. And let me stress the long term. In the short term, if Putin goes tomorrow, we could see someone equally unpleasant and perhaps even more energetic and smart, which would not be good for Ukraine or any of the rest of us. But in the grand scheme of things, look, we are clearly approaching a generational transition. And my experience and my reading of the next generation, the 50-something, the early 60-something-year-olds, the ones who, frankly, are getting increasingly impatient as they see Putin and his collection of 70-year-olds still clinging to power, these are not nice people. But they are essentially amoral, pragmatic kleptocrats. What do they want? They want the opportunity to steal on an industrial scale at home, and enjoy the fruits of that. We've just had the news that, for example, there will be a Russian tourist group going to North Korea to go to a skiing resort. I really don't think that the Russian elite are fine with the fact that they can't go to Aspen or Courchevel because they maybe can now go to North Korea instead. I think this is it. These are people who are very unhappy with the fact that Russia is increasingly becoming a militarized pariah state because they need spare parts for their Mercedes. They want to be able to enjoy their nice penthouse in London, their opportunity safely to bank abroad what they've stolen at home. And so I think these people, well, look, if we're honest, we know how to deal with kleptocrats. We do so every day. These are people who will have every reason to want to improve relations with the West. These are people who want to once again be connected into the global system. And also, these are people who have a perverse incentive to introduce something that Russia has lacked, which is the rule of law. Not again, because I said they're nice people, they're not. But the point is when you've stolen everything, that's the point when you want rule of law to fix and legitimize 
your theft. And especially because Russia is on the cusp of one of the biggest intergenerational transfers of wealth that the world has ever seen. As those people who stole so much in the 90s begin to think about handing it on to their successors and don't necessarily want them to have to fight for it the way they did. It's worth noting that uh, death is once again becoming a business tactic in the, in the Russian economy. And often they, they look at the pampered little darlings and think these people couldn't fight for it the way we had to. So you want there to be a rule of law to, to guarantee that, that transition of your wealth to the next generation. Now, the thing is, and as you can gather, this is a hobby horse issue of mine. You can't have democracy without rule of law. That was part of Russia's mistake in the 1990s. They tried to democratize, but they didn't have rule of law, and therefore it became a stage-managed caricature of the reality. So if the next political generation, for their own selfish reasons, do bring in a certain degree of rule of law, it offers up the prospect that the generation after that might be the democratizing generation. Because I think it's clear that there is a real desire for some kind of real reform within Russia. But it's going to take a long time. And Putin has done nothing, frankly, to speed up the process. Could I ask you a completely different question, really? One of our most downloaded episodes on this podcast um, was last year. I mean, it was an emergency podcast. The, we did it on the Saturday, the day of, the, of Evgeny Prigozhin's sort of march, march on Moscow, whatever, whatever we want to call it. I know Dom calls it the sort of mutiny without a bounty. Um, what did you make of that? I mean, if we look back on that... Did you think when, when you saw the news coming in and you know, the convoy is X amount of you know, miles away from come, coming up to Moscow, that sort of thing, there doesn't seem to be any proper military presence before it, that, all that news filtering in on that day. Looking back on it now, how would you summarise it? What, I mean, what, do you, what do you think happened? As I could say that I discuss in the book I wrote with uh, Anna Aruchunyan, which comes out in June, called Downfall, a biography of Prigozhin and his relationship with Putin. Now, thank you for giving me the opportunity for that shameless plug. My view is that this was, on a personal level, it was a man who, it was Prigozhin, who had never really had to deal with the prospect of a defeat, who was being outmaneuvered by the defence minister and could think of no alternative but to escalate. And so thought that by escalating in this way, he actually could change Putin's mind. This was an act of coercive negotiation. He was not trying to topple Putin or anything. He was just trying to show his muscles and hope that, that would actually overawe Putin into changing his mind. So on one level, it's a very personal matter about this deeply unpleasant man, Prigozhin, and the, the attitudes, which frankly he had picked up in the Russian prison camp system, about when challenged, you always escalate. But it was also a systemic failure of the Putin regime on so many different levels. Putin depends on divide and rule as a way of controlling his elite. He deliberately sets up competing individuals and institutions so that they're duking it out between them. Does two things. One is it means that they're not in a position to combine against him. But also, it leaves him in this position of being the final decider. He can, whenever he wants, reach down and arbitrate any of these decisions, decide who wins, who loses, and such like, which gives people a reason to pander to him. That means that the role of final arbiter is one that he's jealously possessive about. No one else can do that role. And he, therefore, has to be the one who spots when these disputes are about to become dysfunctional, problematic for the regime. And in the past, he has been. Again, I think this is a sign of how Putin gets older. He's less in touch with what's going on in his elite and in his country. And just frankly, he's losing his touch. So although people were telling him that this rivalry was becoming increasingly dangerous, Putin put it off. He doesn't like taking tough decisions. He tends to basically hide away and hope they work themselves out. Well, in this case, hiding away, putting it off, led to this disastrous and embarrassing mutiny. He then scrambled to find some kind of a deal. And interestingly enough, he betrayed Prigozhin. Now, we might think, well, what's the big deal there? Putin betrays people all the time. Except that, look, his state is in some ways like a mafia gang. <laughs> 
sure, it's based on violence and personal relationships, but there also has to be a certain kind of primordial loyalty. And the interesting thing is that Putin, the man who has broken international law, domestic law, he's had opposition figures poisoned, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, this is the first time he has gone back on a deal with someone whom we could regard as an insider. So when he actually assassinated Prigozhin, it was really quite shocking for a lot of figures in the elite because it really suggested that he had essentially chosen to break his understandings with his own elite and realized that he'd made a mistake the first time around. Last point I'd make is you touched on the lack of opposition to this mutiny. Look, this mutiny was never going to take Moscow. They only had a small force. Moscow's a large city. Frankly, even just the non-military garrisons there would have been enough to deal with it. That's not the point. The amazing thing was precisely how little resistance there was on the way. And one of the key elements that has always kept Putin in power has been our assumption that he has absolute control of the security apparatus. Well, this is one of the first real tests. And what we saw is, on the one hand, they didn't join the mutiny. But on the other hand, nor were they that interested in stopping it. They were happy to sit back and just think, well, let's see what happens. The head of the National Guard, a man by the name of Viktor Zolotov, very close to Putin, spent that Saturday desperately on the phone trying to talk to local National Guard commanders along the route of march to get them to do something about it. And as I understand it, the majority of them made damn sure they could not be contacted. The best way of having to avoid either executing orders you don't want to or openly flout them is just not to receive those orders. So I imagine there were a lot of people whose dogs ate their phones or, or, or whatever excuse they gave. And it really reminded us that actually we shouldn't take Putin's strengths for granted because if people don't follow the chain of command, then actually he may have the loyalty of the top people in the security apparatus and the police and the army and the National Guard. But if no one will pick up the phone for them, they're just a bunch of old men in garish uniforms. We're coming to the end of this interview, Mark. So can I just ask you, at the one time, maybe a little unfair question, but I'm, I'm curious as to your, your answer. In the last few years of watching Russia and trying to understand it and explain it, what do you think you've got wrong and why? But also, what do you think you've got right and why? I think in terms of wrong, I mean, I, I've got to hold my hands up. Until about a week before the invasion, I thought it was no more than 40% chance that Putin was actually going to invade Ukraine. Ironically, that's also something that I got right, because the reason I was thinking that was because I was so sure that Ukraine would be a really tough target. They spent eight years preparing just for this kind of situation. Whereas the people who were most bullish that the invasion would happen were also the ones who were convinced that within a couple of weeks, the Russian army would have rolled over the Ukrainians and it would be a done deal. So it's almost, well, choose your own fallacy. So I think the thing is there, what did I get wrong? Again, I think it comes back to this point that we were talking about before about inputs. I had not appreciated just how far Putin had insulated himself from anyone who could say anything critical of his assumption that Ukraine's not a real country, the Ukrainians aren't really going to resist, we can roll in, and essentially it'll be a, a, a police action. And that, for me, I think is where I'm, I'm most likely to get things wrong, is because Putin's inner circle is the blackest of black boxes. These are not people who give interviews about what they tell Putin. We don't get them writing memoirs afterwards or anything like that. We are still having to operate to a degree by rumor and guesswork about exactly what those discussions are. And sometimes I'll get it right. Where I think I, I, I get things right, rightist, if that were a word, is actually in the wider interaction between Putin and the other figures of the elite. And to a degree, that is quite frankly because I'm an old fart. And I have been doing this for decades. And, you know, there are a lot of the figures who not only have I tracked their careers over the years and decades, but through traveling a lot and talking to a lot of people, and particularly 
when I was in Russia, trying to talk to the people who don't usually talk to Westerners. You know, I, sure, I'm very happy to go and have a drink with a pro-Western liberal academic. But actually, for me, often the more interesting people were talking to the hawks, the paranoids, the careerist security officials and so forth, because you get a very different perspective. And I think it's actually getting a sense of how these various dukes and barons of Putin's court interact with each other. You know, who, to be blunt, who slept with whose wife? Who is involved in a business deal with someone else and who got scammed in a business deal with a third person? These are as much as the kind of grand institutional political issues, the kind of things that determine the politics in that circle. Mark Galeotti, is there anything we haven't spoken about or anything you think is important for our listeners to to know and understand? What would you like to, to leave them with? Wow. Look, surely you should never, ever give an academic that kind of an open-ended question because we can fill any amount of space and time with the sound of our own voices. I think the key thing that I would really want to add, which in some ways builds out from some of my earlier points, is this war is clearly uh, an aggressive imperial adventure in which the, the primary victims are the Ukrainians. There's no question about that. However, this is not the Lord of the Rings. The Russians are not the nameless horde of orcs spilling out of Mordor. And I think one of the things that we need to be doing, while clearly that priority has to be, how can we support Ukraine? But we also have to be thinking about what is going to be our relationship with the Russia after the war, and even more importantly, after Putin. Russia is not going away. Russia is not going to fragment. Russia is not going to become a cozy liberal democracy anytime soon. We will have to deal with that. And that means reaching out to ordinary Russians, undermining Putin's propaganda. Again, this is a purely Machiavellian thing. Putin is trying to legitimize himself on the basis of saying the problem is the West hates Russians. And that's why like it or not, we're in a war with the West, and that's why everyone has to band together. We are a beleaguered fortress. And the trouble is when some commentator or politician says something particularly eye-catchingly anti-Russian, I can guarantee you it gets massive airtime on Russian state TV and in Russian newspapers. So I think that actually we need to be undermining Putin, not just in the obvious ways of sanctions to put costs on his economy and to isolate his various collaborators and such like, but also we need to try and isolate Putin from his people. And that's hard to do, because not least because the Kremlin is trying to stop it, and it probably will be something we'll have to be doing at arm's length through in the internet and so forth. But just as... Things like BBC World Service played a really serious role in undermining the Soviet propaganda state. We need to be thinking about what we can do, not just to undermine Putin, but also to lay the groundwork so that in the future, Russians are not feeling embittered. They're not like Germans after World War I, but they actually can realize that we don't have a problem with Russians. We have a problem with this iteration of Russia and Putin and his murderous regime. Mark Galeotti, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, a world affairs newsletter which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps.
If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Charles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.